I'll go with my with my text verse here. And uh, it says, Rejoice in hope, endure in suffering, persist in prayer. Romans 12, 12. Amen. Can you say it with me? Rejoice in hope, endure in suffering, persist in prayer. We're going to focus on the persist in prayer. People don't like hearing about suffering. This was Paul writing, right? So he, he knows that... Uh, <laughs> Nobody likes to hear that, but it's just a fact of life that when you take a stand for the Lord, that you're going to endure some suffering, you're going to be persecuted. People don't like it when you tell them the truth, and it rattles their worldview, but that's what we're called to do. There's nothing uh, nothing super comfortable about uh, confronting people with the truth when they don't want to hear it, but but it's love that drives us, amen? So part of what we're, we're focusing on in prayer tonight is that last part, persist in prayer, but also not to just read lists. You know, our prayer time should be a relational conversation of listening and speaking, listening and speaking, call and response with the Lord because, you know, there's plenty of good ideas, but there's not plenty of God ideas. And it's really easy to confuse the two of those things and help us not to do that, Lord. We want to be people that are tuned into you. I'm going to talk about this on Sunday as well, that, we need to be syncing with heaven, you know, S-Y-N-C, synchronized with heaven and not allowing our emotions to hijack us and, and take us in the wrong direction. We want to be synchronized with heaven so that everything we say lines up with what he's telling us to say. And if we're not sure what to say, we should pause and just say, uh, you know, I need to get back to you on that. I'm not sure yet because a bad answer is much harder to reverse than a slower answer. And I want to know that I'm hearing from the Lord before I give an answer. Amen? So a couple verses. This is where the, the verses right before what I just read, Paul is given real practical instructions. He's saying love without hypocrisy. Remember, it's a Roman culture right now. It's a very pagan, secular culture. So when you say you love somebody, don't be a hypocrite about it. Do it out of sincerity. It's one of the things people love about Trisha, one of the many things, is you know where you stand. She's not a hypocrite. She's not going to play games. She tells you what she thinks and, you know, and, and puts a little oil on it to, so that you, you know she loves you. So love without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Don't settle, right? Don't settle for, for partway truth. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another with mutual love. Show an eagerness, honoring one another. Do not lack in zeal. Can you look at somebody and say that? Do not lack in zeal. Be zealous. Be zealous for God. Be enthusiastic in spirit and serve the Lord. Sometimes when we serve, we can get bogged down and we can feel a little bit tired and resentful. I mentioned John Wimber a lot, and he one night was complaining because he was working a job and doing ministry in addition, and it was late at night, and the other people left, and he was washing the dishes, and he was grumbling a little bit <laughs> to the Lord. Like, well, how come they all left me here? And, and God said to him, uh, do you not like your job? <laughs> and he said, oh, no, Lord, no, really, I'm not saying that. You know, I was just kind of getting in my flesh a little bit here. No, I love my job, and I want to keep serving you. But we want to be enthusiastic as we do it and not let the, let the gas tank run out. Amen? And then he says, rejoice in hope. What, a, what an awesome three words. We rejoice in the hope that we have in you, Lord. No matter what we're dealing with, what, whatever we see, we still rejoice in what we know the, the finish line is going to look like. And I want to have joy on the ride. I want to have joy as I'm getting there. Endure whatever suffering I'm dealing with. And then that last part, the persistent prayer, is just so key that, um, again, I'm, I'm giving credit where it's due with my wife is, I didn't understand persistent prayer. I didn't understand. I thought you, you went and you prayed and then you went to work. <laughs> and not that you could be praying all day while you're at work. I had to learn that. I had to learn that dialogue idea. And, and there's nothing wrong with going into prayer and having a list, but that's not the only thing it is, okay? You with me? You're willing to persist in prayer. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably. Another verse says it this way, pursue peace with all people. You can't control their response to you, but you can control the, your, your actions. You can control your half of the equation. <laughs> Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. 
So that means all through the other things you're doing, you can run this parallel dual tasking. It's not even dual tasking. It's keeping your antenna up to having him speak to you all throughout your day in every situation. And I love this because we talk about praying in the spirit a lot, and we were doing that tonight, and we'll, we'll continue to do it. But this helped me because uh, Bishop Hammond, uh, who will be here for the Northeast School of the Prophets, um, wrote a book called 70 Reasons Why You Should Speak in Tongues. <laughs> and this was just one of the 70, and he's got a, another book out for even more than that first 70. But it helped me because it can be confusing when you live in that logical world of the business world. Like, the, it feels like a waste of time. I'm just babbling here. Why am I doing this? And, and the enemy attacks people with that. It's not really the Lord, whatever. But this is what he says. The one speaking in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. So if you're not sure why you should do it, that's a really good reason. That one kind of just closed the deal for me. And it's like, I'm going to do this because when I'm doing it, even though I may not understand what I'm saying, the Lord is speaking, uh, the spirit is speaking through me to the Lord. Amen. And it says that the Spirit helps us. When we don't know what to pray, the Spirit comes alongside us and helps us. But you, beloved, building yourselves up. This is Jude. Oh, there's only one chapter, verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we're encouraged to pray in tongues, to pray in the Spirit. Even though it might feel to you a little awkward, do it. Just be obedient and do it and know that you're speaking to God. Abraham was our example of faith, and we all can look at him as the father of our faith. And it says here, this is the King James Version, that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. I want to just hear you say it, okay? Say it with me. Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. That's a very, very powerful verse right there, okay? Because he didn't know all the answers, but he was obedient and he listened to God. And unbelief is the opposite of faith, okay? Some people think fear is the opposite of faith. No, I'm going to tell you, courage is the opposite of fear. <laughs> fear wants you to not do it. Courage gets you to step out. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. And it's a very strong negative influence on our lives, so we better be careful. He did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. What did he do? He was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded. Say it. I'm fully persuaded that what God has promised, God is able to perform. Even if I'm not seeing it come to pass yet, I'm fully persuaded he's able to do it and that he will do it. Therefore, his faith, Abraham's faith, was credited to him for righteousness, which is right standing with God. And this is a good part right here. Not for his sake alone, but for our sake also. All right? So we have that down line. We have that genealogy of Abraham. We've been adopted into the family. but We've been grafted into the root of the Lord. And because of that, because of that man's faith and that covenant commitment that he made, that faith of Abraham is something that we look at as a benchmark that we aim for, right? Jesus is the higher example, but by faith, Abraham, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Right standing in God just by believing, not by our actions, not by our doing. <laughs> I can relate to this one. The apostle said, Lord, increase our faith. And I would like you to say that too, because tonight's about speaking the word, okay? Lord, increase my faith. Say it. Lord, increase my faith. I don't want to be bound by unbelief. I want you to increase my faith. That'll be for the rest of our lives. We can be saying that. You'll not reach a point of ultimate where you can't go further. So I need you to increase my faith. And then Hebrews warns us many times, but especially here, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you. Brethren, right? Believers. Beware, believers, that there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. So there's that dual thing again. This part of me really believes it. This part doesn't. So even though I'm a believer, there's a part of me that has an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. And because of that, later in verse 19, that was 12, it says, they could not enter in because of unbelief. So big stronghold. Big opposition to your faith is unbelief. Tear down the stronghold of unbelief in your life by building your faith, by being with other people, by not spending too much time listening to secular news and all the bad news and letting people push your rage button all the time. That's not going to get you there. It's not that you shouldn't know what's going on, but you need to know who's really in charge, right? 
uh, another good saying, I may not know what the future holds, but I know who holds my future. This is really a very sobering verse right here. Mark 6, 5 and 6, it says, Jesus, he could do no mighty works there. God was in their midst. He could do no mighty works in his own hometown. They were too familiar with him. They couldn't see it. They couldn't picture him. They knew him. They knew his sisters and his brothers. And like this, can't, this guy just can't be who he says he is. And God was right in their midst and their unbelief blinded them and stopped them. Same for the Pharisees. And... And Jesus was like, the, the harlots and the tax collectors are getting into the kingdom ahead of you because of your unbelief. Because if you don't think it fits in your box, you can't stretch yourself enough. And that's something that not only is sobering, but we have to learn to, to have weapons to fight against it. And I want to show you a little clip by Dutch Sheets because he says it better than I do. <laughs> And I want you to hear the truth that he speaks in this in this little video clip here that we're going to try to practice a little bit tonight. So go ahead, Ray. This is, it's like, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He says, Rhema. And do not make the mistake. You know, there's, there are teachings that Rhema means revelation. That when God gives you a revelation, that's a Rhema. God can give you revelation from Graphe or Rhema. But that's not what the words mean. The words mean, the word rhema simply means spoken words. And so when you put that back into the verse, what it says is, take the spoken word, which is the sword of the spirit. It is not a sword against the enemy until you say it. Just because you think it, it's not doing anything to the devil. It's helping you, and you can meditate on it. But even meditation means to speak and mutter and, and, and not just think about. But you can think about the Word, and it can help you and encourage you. But it's not a sword against the devil until you say it. And when it comes out of your mouth, it does something in the atmosphere. You start decreeing what God says out loud, your atmosphere in your house will change. You start decreeing what God says about you, your mind will change. You start decreeing what he says about California, California will change. It won't happen just because we came here. And it won't happen just because we leave here encouraged. It won't happen just because we have faith. It will happen when that faith causes us to release something this is the outlet of your spirit. He's pointing at his mouth. Jesus didn't just think, peace be still to the storm. He said it, and he didn't say it because storms can hear. He said it because spoken words have power. And then when they come from God. He didn't say to the fig tree, or he didn't think to the fig tree, nobody's going to eat from you again. He said it, and he didn't say it because fig trees can hear. He said it because the power in him needed to get out of his mouth. That's a much longer teaching. But you all know it says, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Yes? Ephesians chapter 6. It's part of the armor that we all learn about. Well, you know, I can't go into anywhere near the depth that he can on that teaching, but there's really power in the spoken word, right? It's not the sword of the spirit until you speak it. 